Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Preeti. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called True Story and just actively involved in the Ethereum community. Um, and the purpose of this talk is not to take sides on this debate. So I hope you aren't looking for some heated um, debate like that. It's more about educating the community, especially the newer members who aren't aware of where this issue actually started over a year ago. So that everyone's kind of on the same page as we're making the decision on what we do with this. So just to re re uh, recap, where it all starts is kind of the parody hack, which happened about six months ago. And as a refresher, what happened was there was a wallet library contract that a bunch of multi-sig wallets were using. And some random internet user was able to accidentally self-destruct that wallet. He was a, the wallet, um, the, con the, the library wasn't initialized properly, so he was able to initialize it, make himself the owner, and then self-destruct the contract. And those were the actual two transactions that happened. And then what happened after that was all the wallets that were using that library just became inaccessible. So what that meant was 587 wallets became inaccessible. Um, over 500,000 uh, ether was lo basically locked. And that's a lot of ether, right? So the, what EIP 999 basically does is it's a one-time state transition to revive that destroyed contract and, and replace it with the patch version that fixes that bug. And what we allow users to do is regain access to their, to their wallets because it's a one-time change where we basically just directly recreate that account with new parameters. And why they felt it's necessary, it's because the Ethereum protocol doesn't actually allow us to restore contracts that have been self-destructed. Once it's destructed, it's forever gone. And so there's no other simple way for people to regain access to their wallets. And this was the proposal to do that. In time, and talk about a few Before other we talk EIPs about the that pros and cons of this, this that kind of fall into the same bucket and try to solve the same problem, because this this started um, over a year ago. And the, one of the first EIPs that kind of had a similar theme to it was EIP-156. And this was actually proposed by Vitalik. It was reclaiming Ether and common classes of stack accounts. And the idea here was to allow users with Ether or any other assets um, in common classes of stack accounts to withdraw those assets. And these were things like contracts that were accidentally created with no code, or contracts um, where Ether was lost because of replay attacks. So for example, the contract was created on ETC, but then the funds were sent from ETH, um, but the contract was not on ET ETH, and so people lost that ETH. Um, or there were also a bunch of losses due to a buggy, <laughs> a buggy JavaScript library where the JavaScript library was incorrectly um, computing the addresses of the Ethereum, Ethereum addresses. And so a bunch of people also lost or got their Ether stuck because of that. So the proposal was to um, basically do a hard fork to let these people reclaim those, that Ether. And the responses to this were, um, you know, even Vitalik, when he, made, when, he, when he made the proposal, he was like, this is a rescue and it's not a technical improvement. And he made that admission very upfront. And so that's one thing. Two, um, a lot of people were like, are we going to keep hard forking to bail people out? Like, why can't we learn from our mistakes in the past? Um, three, how do we actually draw the line, right? How do we define what is a common class of stack account and what's not a common class of stack account? Where does that, where does that line end? It starts to get very muddy. Um, for who do we actually ascribe these tokens to? Because like it was really hard to determine on chain who sent what when, and like if even if we can claim access to those tokens, how do we know who to ascribe those tokens to? Um, another response was this adds a lot of VM complexity to all the nodes because if we make this change, every single node will have to make this change as well. Do we really want to add this complexity? Is the cost worth it? On the other hand, some felt like this is a fairly, fairly uncontroversial proposal because this is obviously not like, these are obviously stuck accounts. They're not like, um, and so like, why not just give the people their funds back if they're just bugs in libraries that caused it or a replay attack that caused it. Then the second attempt at a similar type of proposal, um, and this was after the parody hack, was EIP 867, which was, the proposal was to standardize 
the process of lost ETH recovery. So not just a one-time change, but actually like standardize the process for how you do it. And not the process, but the format. And the idea was it's similar to EIP where you have an objective standard if you want to propose a recovery. And the idea was to address cases where there's no disagreement in whether it should be recovered or not. It's just obvious to people that this should be recovered. And the goal of this like ETH recovery proposal was we want to minimize the risk in every time we do a recovery. And so there was like a very strict way of how you propose. You had to have a clear justification for what a why the recovery needed to happen. You had to have a verification script that determined the exact actions that needed to, to be take place. You need to have a state change object that all the clients can use to determine all the changes that are happening um, similarly and then you have a set of state change actions that you can make, and those are the only state change actions you can make, and nothing else. And so the goal was, like, if we can standardize it like this, we can really minimize um, the risk of it, so there shouldn't be as much argument about it. It should be obvious to everyone that this is um, a necessary change. The responses to this was, were kind of chaotic. Um, a lot of people felt like, why are we changing, making core protocol changes? Why can't we just build better protection mechanisms in layer two? Um, you know, like, the, this is a valid case. It's, it's like, if we have this proposal standardization, are we going to need a lost funds help desk for Ethereum, basically? Because someone has to review these proposals and actually decide whether to grant it or not. And um, a lot of people felt this kind of human interaction adds a lot of censorship and corruption to the system. Um, for uh, every time there's a recovery that needs to happen, the client devs have to make that change. And so this, it puts a lot of burden on the client devs to make these changes every time. Um, and a lot of people felt like this, this kind of thing would just obviously be abused by people if you involve humans. And actually, one of my favorite responses, I wrote it down, was, if this EIP goes through, suddenly an ERP reviewer's job would become the most important job in crypto, because millions of dollars would depend on it. Shell companies and the mafia would start suing and illegally pressuring reviewers to adhere to their wishes. And I can imagine insurance schemes would be offered by the major companies that have ERP reviewers on their payroll. Within 15 years, the big banks would have mutated the blockchain back to their personal SQL databases. So the, the responses were pretty extreme. Um, it was pretty obvious that not a lot of people were for it. And, okay, now that didn't go through. So then the third attempt was to actually change the self-destruct behavior of how a contract self-destructs. And this would be actually like adding code to actually adding new built-in code to change how the self-destruct works. And there was like four proposals for how to do it. There was like, a, you can add a new create built-in, clean built-in, proxy built-in, or multi-proxy built-in. And the basic idea is, is like, you can, you, you basically add a new code um, t after the fact, so that even if a contract has been self-destructed, it's like retroactive, you can, the new code could protect the lost funds. And I'm summarizing Nick's, um, one of the e EIP reviewers response here because I think it does a really good job of summarizing why this EIP is not the best proposal. And he says, you know, thousands of smart contracts have already been deployed in the network. Under what authority do we have to actually change what these contracts mean? Um, and the most important thing that he pointed out was this, this EIP violates fundamental invariance in Ethereum. Every software has invariants, right? And they operate under these invariants, and we, we're violating those invariants. And the two invariants we're violating are that the code at the contract's address will never change, except to be deleted if the contract self-destructs. We're changing the code. Um, two, a contract's creator has no special access or privilege in regards to the created contract. Now we're giving the, giving the contract creator access to, special access to regain their funds. Overall, it just, again, this is a very retroactive change. It's an ongoing, it felt like, it, felt like it would just add too many side effects and too many, just so too many So how is EIP 999 different? Well, for one, it doesn't add, it doesn't change any EVM semantics. So unlike the, the proposal that Vitalik made, it doesn't actually change the semantics of the EVM. Two, it doesn't introduce any kind of standardized process. And three, it doesn't violate any fundamental invariance in Ethereum. And so what EIP 999 does is it tries to achieve the goal of unfreezing the fund with a single state transition. It's a one-time thing. 
Again, the implementation is there's an irregular change and we're recreating the account at, that, at, at a certain fork in the future. So what, are the, what is the rationale for EIP-999, right? Um, for one, hundreds of innocent individuals are locked out of their funds. Shouldn't they get their money back? Like, they didn't do anything wrong. Why not just give them their money back? Um, two, uh, they pledge that these funds, like over, like whatever, hundreds of millions of dollars of funds that are lost would actually be used towards the ecosystem. If that's the case, it's not like they're profiting from this, so the whole ecosystem would benefit, so why shouldn't they, why shouldn't we just do this? Um, a lot of other people also felt like, look, immutability isn't a fundamental problem of uh, property of blockchain, so I don't think we should have this like ideological debate over this. And again, in the cases where it's not controversial, why not do it? And I think the most sound argument is like, you know, if we do this, it kind of offers the community of choi a choice of both this fork or whichever fork they want to choose based on their preferences and viewpoints and ideologies. So why not give them that choice? The arguments against it are, you know, this is an irregular change that we're creating, but this actually creates, like, it creates ambiguity on what exactly an irregular change is. Like, if, how do we know in the future that that can't be an irregular change or that should be an irregular change? Um, another thing was, like, are we going to have these irregular changes be a popularity contest, basically? Like, you can just get a bunch of people to agree with you, and that's how you determine whether it's an irregular change that's valid or not. Um, there it is, it undermines a lot of the philosophical fundamentals and confidence in the Ethereum blockchain because some people do come into this thinking it's an immutable ledger and we're changing that perception. Um, for it, like, some people felt like, look, they didn't, co they didn't audit the code, so it's their fault. Why should we, why can't they take blame for it? Um, overall, the same kind of argument. It's retroactive, not proactive. And forks um, at this stage really, really disrupt the ecosystem because it's not necessarily a fork if a lot of people are going to support both chains. So why is this significant? Well, I think it's significant because there's really no right answer, obviously, because if there was a right answer, we would have figured it out and moved on a long time ago. Um, and so the really the question is, can we come to a consensus on a single answer? And I think the question to that really is that it's, it's actually a very culture-defining moment, moment for Ethereum because the single answer is based on what our shared social norms are and what our shared political norms are. And to be honest, I don't think we know what those are. And that's why we're stuck at this debate. Like, from the discussions I've heard so far, I think we're trying to look for some like global maximum solution, this one-size-fits-all one solution that works for everyone. And I don't think that exists. And I think the reason it doesn't exist is because there's so many different viewpoints and ideologies that, again, there's no single answer. And if that's the case, every fork, every hard fork like this is going to be incredibly tedious, and we're going to keep, like, the progress will just halt. And I don't really think the solution is going to come from just gauging everyone's viewpoint and ideologies, because there's so many viewpoints and ideologies, and there's no wrong viewpoint. Like, how do you actually go, come to a consensus on something like that? I think the, the solution will actually come from a deep, a deep agreement on what the actual problem is. And I think the current thinking around what the problem is, is that it's a governance problem. But I take a step back and say, I'm not sure it's a governance problem as much, as much as it is something else, which is that we actually need to define what our shared social norms are. Because you can't have a governance process without those norms. That doesn't exist. If you look at what the definition of a governance system is, it's a reinforcement and reproduction of social norms and institutions. So we need to actually do, figure out what those are before we can figure out a governance process that will actually work. Because overall, open communities form around shared norms, and we need to really, as a community, figure out what we're building Ethereum for and have a shared understanding of this. And define a clear vision for Ethereum, because the answer will become much more clear after that. Like, you can't, again, you can't have governance without the shared processes and norms. And I'll leave you with one thing, which is, I did a bunch of research on what makes open source communities successful. And, you know, these are three things that I think we have as an Ethereum community. It's backed by, you know, the Ethereum Foundation or a group of companies. It has skilled and motivated developers. 
it has good communication, relevant, reli reliable mediums of communication. But I think the two that we really need to work on as a community are a clear vision of what this is for. I think everyone is coming into this with their own viewpoints and having that clear definition is important. And surprisingly, what's actually not required for success is the number of developers, the technicals, a formal governance system. Like it's not actually a requirement for open source communities. There's a lot of open source projects that don't have a formal governance process, but they have a shared clear vision um, and a source of funding. So that's the end of it. Thank you. Thank you.